So we start. Om Shruti Smriti Purana Nam Alayam Karunalayam Namami Bhagavad Padam Shankaram Loka Shankaram Shankaram Shankaracharyam Keshavam Padarayanam Sutra Bhashakratau Vande Bhagavantau Punah Punah Ishvaro Guru Ratmeti Murti Veda Vibhagine Yoma Vatyakta Dehaya Dakshina Murtaye Namaha Gukarasthvandhakaro vai Rukarasthvannivartakaha Andhakaranirodhitva Guru Rajya Vidhiyate Sadashiva Samarambham Shankaracharya Madhyamam Asmadacharya Paryantam Vande Guru Paramparam Om Shanno Mitra Shambharunaha Shanno Bhavad Varyama Shanna Indro Brihaspatihi Shanno Vishnu Rukramaha Namo Brahmane Namaste Vayo Tvameva Pratyaksham Brahmasi Tvameva Pratyaksham Brahma Vadishyami Pritam Vadishyami Satyam Vadishyami Tanmam Avatu Tadvaktaram Avatu Avatu Maam Avatu Vaktaram Om Shanti 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 Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karabhavai Tejasvinavadi Tamastumavidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 Yaschandasamrishabho Vishwarupaha Chandobhyodhyamrita Atsambhuva Samendro Medaya Aspranotu Amritasya Devadharano Bhuyasam Shariram Me Vicharshanam Jitva Me Madhumattama Karna Abhyam Bhuri Vishruvam Brahmanas Kosho Simedaya Pitaha Shudam Me Gopaya Om Shanti 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 Aham Rikshasya Reriva Kirti Prishtam Gireriva Urdva Pavitro Vajini Vasvarita Vasni Ravina Gumsa Varchasam Shumedha Amrito Shitaha 
ಇಂಕೋರ್ವೇದಾನುವಚನಂ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಪೂರ್ಣಮದ ಪೂರ್ಣಮಿದ ಪೂರ್ಣ ಪೂರ್ಣಮುದಚ್ಯತೆ ಪೂರ್ಣಸ್ಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮಾಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮೇವಶಿಷ್ಯತೆ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಆಪ್ಯಾಯಂತು ಮಮ ಅಂಗಾನಿ ವಾಕ್ಪ್ರಾಣಶ್ಚಕ್ಷುಶ್ರೋತ್ರಮಥೋ ಬಲಮಿಂದ್ರಿಯಾಣಿ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮೌಪನಿಷತ ಮಾಹಂ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ನಿರಾಕುರ್ಯಾಹ್ಮ ನಿರಾಕರೋತ್ ಅನಿರಾಕರಣಮಸ್ತು ಅನಿರಾಕರಣ ಮೇ ಅಸ್ತು ತದಾತ್ಮನಿ ನಿರತೆಯ ಉಪನಿಷತ್ಸು ಧರ್ಮ ಹೇಮೈ ಸಂತು ಹೇಮೈ ಸಂತು ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ವಾಮೇ ಮನಸಿ ಪ್ರತಿಷ್ಠಿ ಮನೋ ಮೇ ವಾಚಿ ಪ್ರತಿಷ್ಠಿ ಆವಿರಾವೀರ್ಮೇಧಿ ವೇದ ಮಹಾನೀ ಸ್ತ ಮೇ ಮಾ ಪ್ರಹಾಸಿ ಅನೇನಾಧಿತೇನ ಅಹೋರಾತ್ರ ಸಂದಿ ಋತಂ ವದಿಷ್ಯಾಮಿ ಸತ್ಯಂ ವದಿಷ್ಯಾಮಿ ತನ್ಮಾತು ತನ್ಮತ್ತು ಅವತು ಮಾಂ ಅವತು ವಕ್ತಾರಮತು ವಕ್ತಾರ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಭದ್ರನ್ನೋಪಿ ವಾತಯ ಮನ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಭದ್ರನ್ ಕರ್ಣೇಭಿ ಶುಭ್ಯಾಮ ದೇವಾ ಭದ್ರಂ ಪಶ್ಯೇವಕ್ಷಿರ್ಯಚತ್ರೈರಂಗೈಸ್ಸು ವಾಗುಂಸ್ತನು ವ್ಯಶೇಮ ದೇವಿ ತಂ ಯದಾಯು ಸ್ವಸ್ತಿ ನೃಂದ್ರೋ ವೃದ್ಧಶ್ರವಾ ಸ್ವಸ್ತಿ ನೂಷಾ ವಿಶ್ವೇದ ಸ್ವಸ್ತಿ ನಸ್ತಾಕ್ಷೋ ಅರಿಷ್ಟನೇಮಿ ಸ್ವಸ್ತಿ ನೋ ಬೃಹಸ್ಪತಿರ್ದೂ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಯೋ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಾಂಬಿದಾತಿ ಪೂರ್ವ ಯೋ ವೈ ವೇದಾಂಶ ಪ್ರಹಿಣೋತಿ ತಸ್ಮೈ ತಂ ಹದೇವಾತ್ಮಕುಂಕೃತ್ಯಾಶಂಕ್ಷುರ್ವೈಶರಣಮಹಂ ಪ್ರಪದ್ಯೆ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಬಹಿಷ್ಪ್ರಜ್ಞಯತ ಪ್ರಜ್ಞ ಪ್ರಜ್ಞಾನಘನ ಪ್ರಜ್ಞ ಅದೃಷ್ಟ ಅವ್ಯವಹಾರ್ಯ ಅಗ್ರಾಹ್ಯಮಲಕ್ಷಣ ಅಚಿತ್ಯಪದೇಶ್ಯತ್ಮತ್ಯಯ ಸಾರಂ ಪ್ರಪಂಚೋಪಶಮತ್ಯಯ ಸಾರಂ ಪ್ರಪಂಚೋಪಶಮ ಶಾಂತ ಶಿವ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಚತುರ್ಥ ಮನ್ಯಂತೆ ಸ ಆತ್ಮ ಸ ವಿಜ್ಞೇಯ ನಂಬರ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ಟೀನ್ ಸೆವೆಂಟೀನ್ 
அனாதிமாயையா சுப்தோயிவிவர்த்தேதனசம்சய மாண்டூக்கிய உபனிஷத் இஸ் கன்சிடர் டு பி an advanced upanishad in the sense that uh, is it is a distillation of the entire vedantic teaching in a very concise form after you look at all the aspects of uh, our life our experiences who we are what are we trying to do all of those kinds of things then uh, our thought should be crystallized in a concise form uh in the form of the suggestions of mandukya upanishad and they say that uh, uh the uh, uh the serious sadhakas uh ultimately just after having built the background from the other parts of the teaching from the other upanishad bhagavad gita and so on uh finally should just recitate recite uh, not recitate recite the uh, mandukya upanishad think about it and meditate on it this is the final uh, thing so it is considered to be a very uh, uh very advanced upanishad in that sense but then uh, because it is so concise and so uh, so distilled in terms of the thought process thoughts it also requires uh, a lot of study a lot of background building and so on and also even otherwise it requires some explanation of the conciseness of it and this is what is done by gaudapada chakkarika which we are studying but even the karikas and so on unless it is so it's a process even the uh, karikas unless it is explained in the proper manner by someone who's uh, who somewhat understood the the deeper meanings of it it doesn't really doesn't really help very much so for example i was just thinking about it if you look at the uh, the meaning the sentence meaning of the sixth verse anadi mayaya suktaha yada jeevah prabuddhyate ajam anidram aswapnam advaitam buddhyate tadam this is the uh, just to give you an idea so if you look at the english translation of that the uh, the translator has said when the individual soul who's asleep owing to the beginningless maya is awakened he then realizes the unborn sleepless dreamless non duality this is the tra- and really speaking the translation is correct you know with some Uh, we can quibble with some of the words in old english and new english but basically the translation is correct so supposing you are reading this the question is what is that do to you <clears throat> what it really does in the beginning this is what is called paroksha gyana so there can be several stages one could be where you say what I don't understand what they're saying. So assuming that we are not at that stage, we have shraddha and we have an idea of what uh, uh the overall vision that the acharyas are, are conveying to us. And then we our next stage is we look at this and he says, yeah, when the jiva is prabuddhyate when the jiva is uh, awakened, yeah, in the uh, in the sleep state you don't realize is it? but after you wake up you realize it and then uh, then after that the whole thing is gone 
the whole thing is done, not gone, but done. This is how you appreciate it. <laughs> then you go on to, okay, I understand that. Uh, what's the connection? What's, let's go to the next one. This is not teaching. This is not teaching. This is not how the Vedanta, this is what the Sampradaya is. And you have to learn from your teachers how to, how to unfold. This is the, uh, the, one of the favorite uh, phrases of Swami Dayananji was unfolding. So in a way, it's a, like a key of, uh, of a rahasyam, of, a, of a, some kind of a... Oh, you know what? I think so. Let me know. I, I think I know what to do. Hold on. Okay. That's why I didn't wear shawls anymore. I just wore this, but now... Yeah, it's cold, think, you can keep it on the outside. Yeah, no, it's okay. I don't need it. It's, uh, um, so the unfolding is kind of like a key of the, uh, the secret. It's a very interesting secret it is, honestly. It's the best kept secret. You look at the skill of Ishvara, how this whole creation is made is just amazing. That the most important, important goal in your life is already accomplished, but we don't accept it. We don't accept it. This is the secret, the best kept secret in the whole world, Rahasyam. So the teaching methodology means that this has to be slowly unfolded over a period of time with skill, with uh, understanding, with dedication, all of those kinds of things. So I'm just giving you some, uh, some background to this. So we've already started unfolding this uh, verse, and in fact, I think we've been doing it for a while. We'll probably finish it today. So here, you take out any of the words they, the one that we have keyed on out of this verse is the word yada. So just a, uh, let's just uh, summarize it as, a, as an example of the unfolding process. And the unfolding process ultimately results from a paroksha jnanam to an aparoksha jnanam. And here, elsewhere, Swami Maheshananji was saying that uh, just, uh, just a quick uh, side, side trip to it and we'll come back to the word yada. So what happens is that uh, there is, uh, there are two uh, experiences that we have. One is called pratyaksha and the other one is called paroksha. So the pratyaksha means that it is right in front of you and you all you need to do is to use your sense organs to identify the vastu which is in front of you. This is called pratyaksha. Okay, so that there is a table in front of me, it is pratyaksha. There is nothing more that you need to do. That's it, you're done. Then we have paroksha. So paroksha means that something which is not, not in front of you, but it is there. Now, the process of understanding a paroksha vastu is first through words. And then through the words, grasping the presence of the vastu. And so, so for you know, we can take an example that supposing you uh, talk about uh, some new town that you need to go or a new building or something like this. Then some words are used first so that your thinking process is channeled. And then you are following the thinking process and you actually visit it. Okay, so these are the two, uh, two alternatives, paroksha and, and pratyaksha. So now, Ishvara, even though it is Pratyaksha, is taken to be Paroksha. 
and it is uh, it is we we anticipate it it's not as though we are foolish or stupidity on our part or anything like this but this is the way it is this is the subtlety of ishvara so ishvara is a very interesting um, uh, interesting way of looking at it it is almost like there is a person who is right in front of you which should be pratyaksha mm -hmm. but you do not recognize the identity of the person you don't recognize the identity of the person and the identity of the person can be revealed to you through words so their pratyaksha doesn't really is not enough i shouldn't say anything else it should not enough it is there you the person is there you see the person but the the true identity of the person is not really revealed the famous example that swami dayanand ji had once given which i have i'll repeat is that one time he was going on a plane uh, from delhi to uh, uh, dehradun um uh, there were not that many flights at that time now there are more but he was he was on a flight and he was sitting next to a westerner do not be an australian and uh, so the two of them were sitting down and uh, so swami ji struck up a conversation with him and said uh, uh, and so by the time they started talking breakfast being was being served drinks were being served cookies and so on and so forth and so they were talking to each other they knew it you know they could see each other hello how are you this that pleasantries but then swami ji struck up a conversation and said uh, where are what's where are you going so he said you know that i've heard of a swami in uh, i'm coming from uh, all the way from uh, sydney and i'm really keen to to to, to meet with him So he says, "Really, that's wonderful." Which Swami he says, "There's one Swami Dayananda Saraswati." <laughs> Swami ji said, "I was very embarrassed. How should I say that?" He says, "You know, I am that person." <laughs> so here, so look at this. So even though Swami ji was pratyaksha, but he was paroksha because the identity of the person that he was trying to meet was not known to him. and so there words are important so therefore similarly is the situation with ishvara exactly the same situation ishvara is pratyaksha but we think of ishvara first of all the first stage is we don't even think about ishvara then the second stage is we are we want to think about ishvara we have shraddha and we want we are serious and yes yes tell me about ishvara i believe whatever you're saying show me the way at that point ishvara is paroksha very much like the identity of the person is not known and then the with the right use of words the paroksha is which is pratyaksha is turned into a new state which is called aparoksha beautiful word in vedanta just a very wonderful word so there really there are three stages of the experience if you may pratyaksha paroksha and aparoksha so the word aparoksha means not a way if it is not a way then it should be pratyaksha so why are you using a third category it should just be used to paroksha and pratyaksha <coughs> because ishvara is neither pratyaksha nor paroksha Okay, I can understand it is not paroksha, but why is it that it is not pratyaksha? Because Ishvara 
will not appear in front of you like any other object that you see. Then, how will he appear? He will appear as you. Not as this. It will appear you as you. In fact, as we will, we have been saying this, and we will continue to to to, uh, to unfold this. What will happen is that you, as you take yourself to be, will disappear. So you, as you take yourself to be now, which is me as a functioning human being, with the body, with the mind, with the speech, with specificity, here I am at this point in time in, 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 in the form of a functioning, changing, alive human being, that will disappear and it will be taken over by Ishwara in the form of Brahman. What? What do you mean by that? It is very similar. Very similar where you are a dream character. And when the dream is is over. The dream character proves to be false and disappears. It is interesting. I was I wasn't planning to do this. Is not mm -hmm. is not premeditated. It just so happened. It was just a couple of nights ago. I'm sort of. It is very interesting how my dreams are, are, uh, are what kind of dreams I have experiences. I'm very happy. In fact, I feel uh, so, I, oh, I should touch wood. I hope this is wood. Um, I, I, you know, those days where they were scary dreams, and I'm missing a plane or something like this, or plane, or, those are gone. That's good. It, uh, maybe they'll cut. This is what I'm saying. Touch book. I hope that they, it does, if they comes, it comes. It doesn't matter. But just as a indication of progress. My dreams are getting better. <laughs> so a couple of nights ago, this is very clear in my mind. Usually I wake up without a drink, but this one was very clear. So the dream was that four or five of us are have to make a joint presentation to some higher authority. This was the dream. I'm telling you, this is exactly what happened. And so we all checked in into, and it was kind of like a single room with different beds or something, and we are waiting. So when are we going to be called? They said, very soon, very soon we'll be called, and so on and so forth. So then we started unpacking our bags. And uh, I, it certainly occurred to me that, do I have the right clothes? It is fascinating. Mm -hmm. So I take out a shirt, which is not white. It has some patterns in it. And I'm discussing it with my other people. They said, you know, I'm not sure. I think we should have had a white shirt. And it should be a tie and so on and so forth. So I'm saying, maybe I don't have a, what is going to happen to me. I don't have a white shirt. They say, you know, it'll be OK. You stay in the background. <laughs> and so on. This is all there. At this time, I woke up. <clears throat> I tell you, I enjoyed that so much. It was so wonderful. So there is still some tension in left my, my life. That's what I'm saying. I'm not done yet. Although more and more dreams are now coming where I'm in a class teaching, <laughs> discussing. This is good. But sometimes there is some tenseness of this type that comes up. But it is fascinating. I tell you, I enjoyed it. I just lay there and say, my God, this is fascinating. How this is done? And, and it was me as this worried person whether I'm wearing the right clothes or not. I remember unpacking. 
and saying, did I, uh, did I pack it? No, I don't think I did. I should have done it. And the other people are looking at me and says, oh, I guess you, you don't think about these things ahead of time. <laughs> and all those things. So there's a slight tension. So anyway, so what happens <coughs> is that uh, the upper, the aparoksha, aparoksha process is the final the the final uh, stage of this understanding is that when Ishwara, in the form of Brahman, not in the form of Brahman, but in the very content of Brahman as the very consciousness, which is nothing but you becomes clear, then what happens is that your identity, your conclusion, your what is what is called uh, in Sanskritam abhimana, your abhimana means how you take yourself to be, who do you think you are, that abhimana disappears as a human being. And it is not as though, it is not as though you are, you are keeping your abhimana and improving it. You know that sometimes, for example, when you start a new organization, then your, first of all, your abhimana was that I am just a family member. I am, um, you know, a parent of a number of children. This is your abhimana. Then supposing you, lar you join a larger organization, then that abhimana takes over. Uh, examples are given. So, for example, then you have uh, people who are sacrificing their lives for their countries. Uh, it was very famous in the Second World War, and actually always happens in that the Japanese, their sense of loyalty to their country and to the king was so overwhelming that they <coughs> sacrificed their entire life, their family life, so on to join the army. They had a passion that the Japanese must prevail and the harakiri is no problem, I'll just die. And their conduct in the Second World War is amazing. Same thing with the, with the Germans. And so there is a certain higher identity, this is what I'm saying, that can subsume you. But that identity also is through thoughts, through commitment and so on. Here, this is not like that. So what happens is there is there is no other identity that you should take, but you need to give up all the identities. And it will happen. So for example, in going back to the example of the dream, it is not as though you are taking another identity within the dream. You see, that's, the, that's what I wanted to, I think that's, that's the way I would explain it. In fact, all identities are replaced by something bigger, higher. All thing is gone. And so here what will happen is that, that, the, that Brahman will, will, your ahankara will disappear. And you will realize that my sense of separation from Ishwara was false. And it will maybe remain as a slight memory. And the only difference would be that in the case of the dream, uh, I struggle to remember some of the, some of the, uh, uh, some of the details about the dream. Because it was, uh, you know, dreams we don't remember very much. It's gone. <laughs> And I have to think about it, and I can't even hardly think about it. But in the case of the Jivan Mukta, your Prarabdha Karma will still maintain your previous identity, and you would laugh at it. You would laugh at it, even though you found that all the identities are subsumed 
with this uh, with this new one so in summary uh, and i'll come back to uh, that in summary the process is that the uh, the paroksha vastu which is ishvara is first introduced through words and the only difference is that unlike a paroksha vastu like a new town that you need to visit becomes switches over from paroksha to pratyaksha here the paroksha becomes aparoksha which becomes you alone nothing that you see you won't see anything but what you will see is that what my understanding of the outside world is not really true just like when you wake up from the dream it is not true at all so therefore now to close the loop the process of teaching is where the words are unfolded in a manner which improves your understanding of the aparoksha vastu so with that let us revisit the word yada which we have explained in the last couple of classes and we'll summarize it and then move on so yada our obvious understanding of the word yada which means when So whenever you say when what do you think about you think about a point in time you know you think about a point in time is not the meaning that is being conveyed here this is the this is the this is what life teaching this is the informed teaching this is the unfolding that has to occur is all i'm saying is that uh, it is not like uh, just you read a sentence you go on but you have to really unfold it in a manner it should be done and then to think about it so yada no- normally means a point in time here yeah, it just doesn't mean that it means that when the jiva is awakened to the fact that all time disappears into timelessness and this comes from understanding it because unlike the dream which is a little sample given by ishwara for you to see an example but there the whole dream disappears and it's easy to see that it's gone the dream time becomes non dream time it becomes we don't know how long it was it appears to be very long sometimes if it is having a nightmare it appears for a long time just like anything else if you're having a nice dream then it happens to very quickly but whatever time it is it is not real time it goes so there it is easy to see but here the understanding would be where you still have an appearance of time but within that you have to see timelessness and so one answer of this is that if you evaluate yourself within time you stay as a jiva and if you evaluate yourself correctly as it should happen with your with your thinking and your knowledge and so on you transcend jivatva you become immortal and that immortality should happen now because the timelessness is aparoksha time is pratyaksha but timelessness is aparoksha so we 
we should see, in fact, this is the entire vision of Vedanta. The entire vision of Vedanta is that the content of anything is the formlessness of that thing. So the content of time is now. Now. That nowness never changes. It is now. The time changes in the past, the future, even now. If you were to, Swami Dhananji used to dissect it. They say, when you say now, what do you mean? How long is the now? You'll say perhaps within two or three seconds. No, keep on dissecting it. And you cannot keep on dissecting it to a point where it is a single point. It is pointless. That is now. And I have to see that really nowness. And, and so the only thing that interferes with that is the doubt, really? Am I really timeless? But what about this body? Immediately some doubts will come in to interrupt, to, uh, to, uh, to sully the purity of that. But that, that just needs to, to be answered with, with answers to the doubts. And so the timelessness. So just to, to summarize this, the essence of this teaching is to understand the formlessness of all forms. And the fact that the forms of any kind do not result in nothingness. This is the thing we have to see. The aim of all thinking, the content of all manifestation is not, not nothingness, it is formlessness. And so, for example, the content of all thoughts so we talked about the time. The con similarly, the content of all thoughts is not no thoughts, but thoughtlessness. The content of all spatial specificity is non-specificity. That I am here is a function of jiva. I am here and now. So there the two coordinates work together. Most subtle coordinates this is uh, the very beginning of the of the Maya Shakti. That the time and the and the space together make me a specific jiva. And the content of the specific jiva, no matter how you look at it, either from a time or a spatial standpoint, is formlessness. Isha Vasya Midam Sarvam Yat Kinchit Jagatyam Jagat So my, my understanding is correct when I see that I am being think I'm just thinking of myself here now at this point, at this time. Then if you want to if you want to uh, uh, to extend that to the, uh, the, the third element of that is that not only do I think about myself at this time and this space, 
but in the following form by this form whatever your form is whatever your age is whatever the stages of your life this is how you think about it so this is what is called parichinnatvam parichinnatvam means that your whole conclusion is with respect to a particular form you think of yourself as a pratyaksha but in fact you are the content of all three of them without any form and it is the same person this is why so there for example satyam yanam and anantam is that formless entity that you are where you have do not have any parichinnatvam with respect to time any parichinnatvam means to the the very uh, uh, limitedness specificity so you don't have any specificity with respect to time with respect to space or with respect to being a vastu having a particular form those are all superimposed on your own reality just like a dream is superimposed upon your reality and when you uh, when when you when you see this when you see this fact then you cross over from becoming from being and not becoming from being a jiva to understanding yourself as being non separate from ishwara because this is ishwara's glory it is not your glory it is ishwara's glory that the content of all parichinnatvam is aparichinnatvam satyam gyanam anant any kind of uh, limitation results in a non limitation and this is given as an example in deep sleep beautiful in deep sleep this is given as a little sample for you to taste just like you go to these farmers <laughs> markets and you're given a little sample to taste and uh, then you have to get the whole thing but the sample is given so that you have least at least some experience of what how good this thing is so the deep sleep is a sample of aparichinna satyam gyanam anantam but this game of ishwara is is something where you you now have to deserve the understanding of this aparichinnatvam so now you can see the word yada so the meaning of the word yada is not a point in time but it means that that at the stage where you see that time is a mithya whose whose content is brahma chaitanya at at that stage you are free from being a cap of time so um i i forget whether it was uh, there was some discussion on we're going to go to verse number 17 hopefully today <laughs> i think we've been doing 16 for a long time but it's a very interesting thing just think about it this today 
so uh, and uh, so I'll actually borrow some of the ideas from 17 uh, to complete this this thought so here's how it is the the conclusion that you are a limited being under the spell of time there is no no reality to it except the reality that you give it okay so there is no reality to the conclusion that I am bound within a particular point in time and space is no reality to it. But you are the one as the Chetana Vastu that gives it the reality. Here an example is given, very beautiful example really. I mean uh, these are all just play of words but I think the way the masters Swami Meshwaranji had given this explanation and it really gives a new way of looking at things. So here, let's look at it. Swamiji said, look, a baby is born. Jiva is born. Takes on a new identity in this life. Baby. Nine inches, one foot maybe. Weighs about seven ounces. This is the baby. Now that baby, which was one foot, has become six feet and weighs 200 pounds. Okay? And now, so here's the thing. The baby has disappeared. You can only take pictures and show him. This is what happens to the, uh, this is very fascinating things. You show pictures to uh, children that are grown up and they're saying, that's, is that me? Was I a baby? You say, yep, that's you. Go, wow, how cute I looked, so wonderful. <laughs> and so that baby is only in pictures, it has disappeared. See, it has disappeared. Okay, forget about the baby. What if we see the starting point to be, I don't know, we all have memories going back to different ages, but let's say four-year-old. By three or four-year-old, now you, you do have a memory. Because I remember the time, I was telling you this, when I was first sent to the kindergarten school and my mother left me. And those feeling that I am alone, my mom is not here, who are these people? What's going to happen to me is still very fresh in my mind. So that memory, that person who was four year old is no longer there, disappeared. But you know what? There is something <coughs> which associates that four year old to who I am. So you look at the logic of this. this is it. Examine the logic. That four-year-old is no longer there. But the linking that the four-year-old was none other than me is still there. And in fact, this is what happens we, throughout our lives. We say, when I was 12, when I was 15, then I went to college, then I was married, then this happened. This entire linking because all the stages of your life keeps on disappearing. They're no longer there, except in pictures. But you have a firm conclusion, this is me. This is who I was in the old time. Who does that? Who gives that reality? You, the Chaitanam was Chaitanam was. You, the Brahman, is the one that gives it the reality. 
So the real, the source of reality, the source of reality is you. You are the one that giving, that is giving the reality to a certain conclusion. So the conclusion itself has no reality. But you are the reality. So this will uh, this will be explained a little bit more. In fact, let's just read it, and so then uh, I haven't finished sixteen. I'll go back to sixteen. But on this point, I just since I'm unfolding this part, that comes in number seventeen. So in seventeen. Prapanchaha yadi vidyeta nivartetana samshayaha maya matram idam dvaitam advaitam paramarthataha. So, if you look at the English translation of it, uh, this prapancha, which is the projected creation, were, were really existing. It would continue to be no doubt. But this duality is just an appearance. Don't like the word illusion. That's a separate thing altogether. But appearance is a good word. That duality is just maya, which is an appearance. And there is only non duality in reality. There's a lot of, I think we'll have to change some of the words, but so look at the Sanskritam for this. Maya matram idam dvaitam advaitam paramarthata. So now I can explain and connect it to the example I was giving earlier about the baby and the four year old and so on. And really speaking, paramarthataha means, Paramartha here means Brahman, Ishvara, which is, which is the ultimate reality and which is you. It's none other than you. This is why you are giving reality to something that doesn't exist. You are giving reality to the fact that you were a baby. Because the reality to the fact that you are a baby is not harmless. It is very harmful. You know why it is harmful? Because that is the, that is the very seed of your conclusion that I am only this much. I have only this many, this many more years to live. The fact that you understand that you were the baby is also giving you the conclusion that I have only little time to live. To so this, this linear conclusion that I'm born at a certain time and I'm going to die at a certain time is the reality you are giving. There's no other reality to it. You see, this is the thing. So understand this. There's no other reality to it. You are the if, the, if the wave is changing and you think that you are just the wave, there's no reality to the wave. The only reality to the wave is the water. So similarly, you are the reality. Paramarthata. Maya, Maya, Maya matram idam dvaitam. You are the one who thinks that I was born and I'm going to live and I'm going to live this much. And that reality is the one you are upholding because of, because of ignorance. So now going back to it, I'll complete the number 17, but we still have some more work to do. We haven't even looked at the second word, second line of the verse number 16 yet. So, so I think we are, please understand that 
the word yada is not a point in time but a stage where the jiva understand that the point in time is just maya matram the reality the reality of time is timelessness so we have done all of that and when was it started it never started anadi maya always there and as a result of that now comes the second line ajam ajam means that you should see that you were never born so let's look at this this word ajam or jam jam means to be born let's look at that let's look examine that for a minute so what is janma what is jam janma means birth what is it what does it mean what it means is an appreciation that at one time something is not there and at the next moment it is there this is janma this is how you define janma isn't it this is the airtight definition of birth and can be a birth of anything can be a birth of a wave in an ocean but or it could be the birth of a baby but in any case or the the formation of a fetus when the woman finds out that she is pregnant there is some confirmation of that and then uh, through all these modern instruments which i don't understand you can actually see the 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 formation of the fetus in the womb of the mother so there there is some knowledge some awareness that there is a change in state that occurs by not being there one time and being there the very next time this is what janma is this is the definition so now the question is when were you born how will you know that the consciousness is born the only way you will know because we say that you are formless consciousness satyam gyanam anantam aparokshat gyanam this is what we say so you have to follow the the entire definition this is what we say so the question is how are we going to find out the birth of this satyam gyanam anantam because one of the things that is, uh, is is something you should appreciate is that vedanta is very specific to pramanam very pramanam means proof everything has to have proof we do not accept anything without proof you think that the scientists are they have a special privy to proof we have even more of a privy to proof even the scientists cannot really because the scientists also they are uh, they also uh, they have a firm belief that that somehow this whole creation was born and uh, and so that belief has no proof to it so they also are ultimately proofless but not vedanta vedanta says says anything you have to specify you have to give a proof so now we say where is the birth for satyam gyanam ananta brahma so vedanta says for that what will happen is the only proof that it has or would have to have is that someone will say at this moment the 
Brahman was not there and at this moment the Brahman is born. This is the definition of Janma. Somebody has to give a proof. Now in the case of your mom and dad, they can see that there was a fetus born on such and such day. Like this is how the baby completed the nine month and it became a baby. So there is a proof for it. All that is there. But we are talking about a jiva. We are not talking about Brahman. So someone would have to specify that the Brahman was born. Only then we will say Brahman, which is the very form of Ishvara, which is Atma, is born. You can't say that. Why can't we say that? Because there needs to be someone who is also another consciousness will say, I saw consciousness being born. That doesn't happen. So really speaking, believe it or not, we are, but, but, but to, to have a conclusion which is not valid is possible. This is how the whole creation is. Pratiti matram, maya matram. You can keep on believing that there are certain things without requiring the proof for it. That is possible. And so, you keep on believing that I was born on a particular day. But really, this is aviveka. This is not discrimination. You should be talking about, I as a baby was born. Fine. We accept it. You cannot say that I was born. Cannot say that. Why can't we say that? Because this is just an assumption that you have. You're clinging on to it un, in a non-irrational clinging on to it. It's called irrational clinging. That's it. And the moment you find, my goodness, I cannot believe it. Because we, our minds cannot comprehend that I can, I can be ajanma, ajam. But the moment you see that, that possibility, this is what the teaching has to really do, is to develop that possibility so that you have a better understanding. You, you accept it for who you are. And that ajam is timeless. So this is the, you can see the, the linking of the first, first line to the second line. Anadi mayaya suptaha yada jivaha prabhudyate Ajam. Anidram. Anidram means that just like you, now is no longer a kind of a make-belief because Ishvara has given you the ultimate make-belief which is Swapna. Ultimate. Yeah, I mean, here I am. I'm you know, a Vedanta teacher and this, that or the other, I'm supposed to be, be a follower of truth. I can have a dream where I'm not wearing the right shirt. Amazing. It really brought a smile to my lips when I woke up. I said, wow. That is just, this is the ultimate make-believe. It's possible. This is what is called anidra. Anidra means that nothing, it is no make-belief there. Not possible. So, anajam, anidram, aswapnam. Anidram, sorry, anidram here, aswapnam is already there. So, anidram here means one which is, uh, which is devoid of any, any, um, uh, any ignorance whatsoever. Because in nidra, in deep sleep, even though you are very close to Brahman, you are ignorant of the fact that you are Brahman. So that is, uh, that is the uh, ignorance that envelops you. It's total darkness. Who you are, you have no idea. So that doesn't happen. So ajam anidram aswapnam advaitam. And therefore, advaitam. 
Advaita means that there is only one reality. So Advaitam doesn't mean this is a huge topic. Let's see. Um, yeah, this really comes in more on 17, but I'll just uh, uh, briefly mention it. Advaitam doesn't mean the absence of Dvaitam, of duality. This is a very, very big thing we should see. Amongst our, uh, our hang-ups, our favorite hang-ups. So one of the favorite hang-ups is that how can I be um, timeless? This is one of the hang-ups. So all these are hang-ups. These are, these are perceptions that have no reality to it. We just hang on to it. So this is one hang-up. Another hang-up is that yes, I am living in a jagat of Dvaita. What does it mean? That means I find that situations and people are limiting me. Are limiting me. Other people are bothering me. And situations are bothering me. This is the assumption I have. And so therefore I extend it to say that if I removed all situations that bother me, remove all the people that bother me, then I will be okay. And in fact, this is the very basis of, uh, of, uh, of meditation and yoga. Meditation is that, in fact, the entire teaching of Patanjali is Chitta Vritti Nirodha. You remove all thoughts. The thought comes in that those people, that, that person is really bothering me. Okay, that's just a thought, right? If that person is no longer bothering you right now, but your thought that the person is bothering you is bothering you. So remove that thought. And so you go through a lot of uh, stages for it, you know, and uh, then slowly, slowly you just do samadhi. And in samadhi, you are just looking at yourself and you're not, no one is there. And you love it. You love it because nothing bothers you at this point. You feel, wow, this is me. This is wonderful. So, this is another hang-up. So, consider this. After a while, your samadhi has to be ended. Because I was telling you, that if nothing else, you have to go to the bathroom. You had a lot of water and liquid and so on and so forth. And you're sitting in samadhi and you said, nothing bothers me. Fine, nothing bothers you, but your bladder bothers you. <laughs> and then you say, wow, gosh, next time I'm not going to drink any water. Then what will happen is your hunger bothers you. Something will bother you. So this is not Advaita. The lack of Dvaita is not Advaita. This is another hang-up that we have. Somehow we have this romantic feeling that if I can just be by, go on the top of a mountain. And so all these uh, Buddhist uh, retreats where you go on the top of a mountain and you just chant home or whatever the Buddhists do, I have no idea. And then you just stay within yourself. And you really enjoy it. And then you know what you say? I have to come back to this camp again. That was so enjoyable. But what happened to the rest of them? Now I have a miserable life for the next six months. But then when I have enough money, I'll go back to the same camp and enjoy. <coughs> this is another hang-up. This is not Advaita. How long are you going to do this? The real Advaita is where it is understood that there is no Dvaitam. Time is Dvaitam. Spatial limitation is Dvaitam. Vastu limitation is Dvaitam. The very reality of all of them is 
timelessness, facelessness, vastulessness. That is the ultimate Advaitam. Paramarthataha. So anyway, I very sure that I'm going to run time, uh, run out of time, but let's just do finishing this off. So Ajam Anidram Aswapnam Advaitam Buddhyate Tada that the real understanding of this truth is that the Dvait, which what appeared to be Dvaitam is really a Dvaitam. What appeared to be to be different waves of the ocean are really nothing but the very expressions of the reality of the water, which is there's no advai, there's no dvaitam in a, in an ocean. There's no dvaitam. There's only advaitam. And the various waves are simply nothing but the expression of the same advaitam. They're a different level of reality. <coughs> You cannot say there is Dvaitam and there is Advaitam. You cannot say that because the Advaitam, it's, it's, it's like saying that, uh, that, that dreams bother me. They have, they have an interesting play. But really speaking, there's not the same level of reality as being awake. Gone. So, Advaitam Buddhyate Tada. And this is explained a little bit more detail on the 17, which we'll do next time. So um, uh, even though I think we've already taken a step towards it, then I think what I was thinking of doing is continuing on with uh, verse number 18 also. Uh, so might take another class or so. Then we will uh, revise all we have done before in a short form. Uh, I think uh, that's, I, I'm beginning to think that that becomes very useful. You have to go back and then uh, summarize, and then we will summarize from the very first verse of the uh, Upanishad itself and do the Karika also up to number 18. Uh, that might take several classes, so it's not going to be happening in one class, but we will do that. Then we will pause and uh, go to the next uh, verse of the uh, Upanishad. So we have only been doing up to number seven, which is Nantav Pragyam, Nabahish Pragyam, and so on. And after that revision, uh, which will start hopefully, maybe not next time, but the class after next, and then we'll take several classes to revise it. Then we will go to uh, number eight, Saha Ayamatma Adhyaksha Omkara. Let's <coughs> get the time. Om Swasti Bhav Paripalayantam Nyayena Margena Mahim Mahisha Gogdam Manevya Shudavastu Nityam Loka samastha sukhino bhavantu Kale varshatu pachanya Prithvi sasya shalini Desho yamsho varahitaha Brahmana santu nirbhaya Sarve bhavantu sukhinaha Sarve santu niramaya Sarve mantrani pashyantu Makarchitu kabhaghave Asato ma sadgamaya, amaso ma jyotir gamaya, vrityo ma amritam gamaya, om purna madhav purna mitam purna purna mudachyate, purna sya purna madhaya purna meva vashishyate, om shanti shanti shanti.